Hello. Good morning. It's Friday. Yay. It's Friday. Um, this morning I'm going to do a double bill. In fact, I'm going to, I realised I'm going to have to do a double bill for the last three readings. So this morning we're going to have chapter 12 and then I'll start a new video and do chapter 13 so that they are kept separate so that um, it doesn't get too long and too cumbersome. And um, then Monday we'll do chapters 14 and 15 and um, Tuesday we'll do, do chapters 16 and 17 which takes us to the end because my children, two of my children are off on Wednesday next week um, <clears throat> and then the third is off on Thursday and then we're all going away for a week, we hope, um, on Friday. Um, who knows? Who knows? So yeah, there we are. Um, two chapters today and we're going to start with chapter 12 right now so um yeah we're starting to see some really quite unpleasant behavior aren't we joe has started to see some really nasty stuff he's overheard the footman uh taunting amos and spilling wax over him and then he's just um witnessed uh tobias deliberately knocking the coffee tray out of amos's hand um so that it smashes on the floor and it spills hot coffee all over him and Amos, far from from telling William, Lucy's father, what's just happened, he just apologises and picks it all up and cleans up and, and William seems not to know. And Joe doesn't know whether to say anything because he sort of feels, well, if Amos didn't say, then it's not my place to. Um, although he's absolutely outraged at what Tobias has just done. OK. <clears throat> This is Sunday afternoon, chapter 12. The rest of the afternoon passed slowly. Lucy was playing with Thomas when Joe came out again, so there was no chance of telling her what he'd witnessed. The injustice of it made his chest tight. Why hadn't Amos told William what had really happened? He shouldn't take the blame for something he hadn't done. It was similar in a way to Jackson and the wax... Joe was quite certain now that Amos wouldn't have said anything to William about that either. Was it possible, he wondered, that Lucy was wrong and Tobias and the footman were working together after all? But even if they were, he couldn't see what they hoped to achieve. Did they just want to make Amos's life miserable or did they have a more sinister goal in mind? When at last he was alone with Lucy, she brought up a different subject before he had a chance to mention it. Mother was talking about you going to school tomorrow, she said, closing the door of her room. You weren't sure you'd still be here, but since you are, we have to do something this evening, unless you've changed your mind about going with Peter. Joe gulped. He'd been so preoccupied with Amos, he'd forgotten all about school. You're not still suggesting you break my wrist, he asked with a nervous laugh. I don't think so, Lucy said slowly. You don't think so? It's just, she frowned, I can't think of any other excuse for you not being able to write. Maybe not a broken wrist, but it has to be an injury of some sort. An injury, Joe echoed. Lucy made a face. It does really need to be something that stops you holding a quill. Couldn't we just pretend? What if I said I'd sprained my, sprained my wrist? What does that mean? It's when you twist something awkwardly. We could bandage it up and put it in a sling. Lucy shook her head. Nobody will believe that. They'll think you're just making excuses for not going to school, which I suppose you are. I'm afraid it has to be much more convincing. They were both quiet for a few moments. Then she said, A cut across your writing hand would do it. It would have to be quite a bad one, though. Not just a scratch. What with? Joe asked faintly. We could use a pen knife. But they're blunt, he objected, thinking of his knife at home. No, they're not. Lucy stared at him. You might have made a terrible job of cutting your quill, but it wasn't because the knife was blunt. Anything that cuts through the shaft of a goose feather is more than sharp enough for flesh. They looked at each other. Joe shuddered. 
There has to be some other way, he pleaded. Couldn't I just lose Peter on the way to school and not turn up? Not if you want to come back here at the end of the day, Lucy said. What if I told Peter the truth, Joe said. Then he could cover for me. I presume your parents are writing a letter for me to take back to explain... Sorry, I presume your parents are writing a letter for me to take to explain why I'm back. The school won't be expecting me, so if I didn't turn up, nobody would notice. As long as Peter knows the truth, that should work fine. But you can't tell Peter you're not Josiah, Lucy insisted. He won't believe you. You did. Lucy, uh, Joe was aware of his voice rising. I saw you vanish, Lucy reminded him, and I still find it incredible. She went over to the writing desk, which stood beside the window. Come on, she said, turning to Joe. In her hand was a knife with a thin blade. There's nothing else for it. Joe backed away. Actually, wait a moment, Lucy said. We'll need a cloth to wrap round the wound while we go and find my mother. We don't want blood everywhere. She went to the chest of drawers and took out a handkerchief, which she spread on the desk. Then she motioned to Joe to come and sit down. Haltingly, he crossed the room. He was still racking his brains for a way out of this. Perhaps he should just go to school with Peter and take the consequences. But he knew there would be no way of keeping up the pretense of being Josiah once he had failed to do everything Josiah could do. A little cut on the hand wouldn't be so bad, he told himself. It was possible, of course, that the shock of doing it would spin him back into his own time. That would be annoying, but not disastrous. And it would have the advantage that he wouldn't have to put up with the pain for more than a, than a few seconds. The pain. He mustn't think about it. But his heart was pounding. He felt hot and shivery at the same time. His stomach had shrunk to nothing inside him. He sank down in the chair in front of the desk. It was the deliberateness of it that was the problem, he reasoned. After all, he'd cut himself hundreds of times by accident, and it had never been a big deal. Can I see the blade? he asked. You can hold it, Lucy replied. You're doing this, not me. Joe took the brass handle with trembling fingers. The blade was about as long as his thumb, and as wide as the nail on his little finger. It looked viciously sharp but at least it was clean as far as he could tell. He wiped it thoroughly on the handkerchief just to be on the safe side. He knew he was procrastinating. He tested the cutting edge against his thumb. It was like a razor. His guts heaved at the thought of pressing it down through his skin. <clears throat> Taking the knife in his left hand, he spread out his right palm up. The blade quivered. He screwed his eyes shut to summon up the courage and thought about the scars he'd got in her previous worlds. Each of those wounds had been excruciating at the time, but they'd healed over the moment he was back in the present. So even if he cut through a muscle or a tendon or something, it shouldn't matter. The trouble was, this time he might have to bear the pain for several days. Moreover, he hadn't known the other wounds were coming until they happened. He'd already had much too long to think about this one. Beside him, he heard Lucy catch her breath. His eyes flew open. In the same instant, she seized the knife and slashed it across his hand. Shock jolted through him. She'd said he had to do it. A scarlet line marked the path of the blade. He watched it broaden. He could barely feel anything, although blood was already spilling out of the cut. His heart hammered. Sweat broke out on his forehead. Lucy was talking. He couldn't hear her properly. He saw a shape moving towards him. But then he couldn't see it any more. His mind swirled. Perhaps this was it. Perhaps he was slipping out of Lucy's time. Though it didn't feel quite like it usually did. Then she was bending over him. Sorry, Joe, she said. I saw that you couldn't do it. She wrapped the handkerchief around his hand. At once, a bright red flower burst out over the cloth. 
and then Aunt Catherine came in. Joe turned his head, bewildered. It seems she can't stand the sight of blood. Lucy pointed to the floor. Catherine lay awkwardly, her skin ashen, her eyes closed. It's probably just as well, Lucy went on. I said you'd been cutting a new quill, but of course there isn't one on the desk. If she hadn't fainted, she might have noticed. Here, hold this. She moved to his left hand to pin the drenched handkerchief in place while she took out a quill and cutting board and put them on the desk. Let's take you down to my mother and get someone sent up to my aunt. She helped Joe to his feet. He staggered. His head was still fuzzy and he felt nauseous. But he obviously wasn't going to be pulled back into his own world after all. He let Lucy steer him out of the room. Perhaps we should wash the cut, she suggested. And then almost immediately, no, it'll look more impressive to my mother if you're really covered in blood. They went slowly downstairs. Joe's limbs stopped shaking and his head cleared. His hand was now throbbing, but the reality of the pain was actually less bad than the thought of it. He followed Joe, Lu sorry, he followed Lucy into the withdrawing room. Joe's cut himself, she said, without preamble. Ellen looked up from her sewing. It's Joe now, is it? She raised an eyebrow. Lucy reddened. Her mother looked at Joe. Dear me, what a mess. She rang the bell. Whatever were you doing? Cutting a new quill for tomorrow, aunt, Joe said. The blade slipped. It really did. Ellen looked at him quizzically. Are you left-handed? Before he could reply, the maid appeared. It's not only Josiah who needs attention, Lucy said, taking care to get his name right this time. My aunt fainted when she saw the blood. She's upstairs. Swiftly, Ellen issued instructions for Mary to be sent to Catherine and for Joe to go with the housemaid. Lucy didn't come with him. At the door to the servant's staircase, Joe paused. Lucy had said you didn't go down here, but the maid beckoned him to follow. Downstairs, they went into a room with a scrubbed table some sort of frame with wo wooden rollers and a row of irons standing beside the fireplace. Wait here, please, Master Josiah, she said. A minute later, she returned with a tray. On it were two bowls, one large and one small, a bundle of cloth and a jar of something yellowish. The maid began to tear the cloth into strips. Let's clean you up first, she said, unwinding the soaked handkerchief and dipping a piece of the cloth in the small bowl. Is that water? Joe asked. That's right. The maid dabbed his hand gently. The water looked clean and it was quite warm. Joe hoped that meant it had been boiled. There now, the bleeding has nearly stopped, she said. Put your hand in here and hold it under. She pushed the larger bowl towards him. What's that? Joe was wary. This liquid was a clear brown colour. Brandy, said the maid. It's just the thing for a wound. I'd rather not, if you don't mind, Joe said. She looked taken aback. Very well. In that case, we'll just put the balsam on. She unscrewed the lid of the jar. A smell rose up that reminded Joe of the time his parents had painted the kitchen. What is it? he asked. Venice turpentine, she replied, smearing the grease across his cup before he could stop her. No, Joe cried. Mum and Dad used turpentine to clean paintbrushes. He snatched his hand away and started scrubbing at it. Now then, Master Josiah, the maid exclaimed. You need to seal that wound. I don't want it, Joe said through gritted teeth, scouring it with a cloth. The cut started to bleed again. Now see what you've done. The maid threw up her hands in dismay. I do not want that stuff on it. He repeated. The pain made him gasp, but he carried on scrubbing. If it bled enough, the cut might wash itself clean. All right, Master Josiah, all right, calm yourself. Let's bind it up then, nice and tight. By the time Joe was back upstairs, the fingers on his right hand were purple from lack of circulation. All done? Lucy asked. The maid just tried to put some horrible ointment on it, Joe snapped. 
He felt weak and sick. It's one of the things I really hate about being with you. The so-called medicines and soaps and things. That reminds me, what was in the tooth stuff Amos gave me? Why was it black? It's charcoal, of course. Mixed with honey. Lucy sounded put out. Well, I suppose charcoal is better than the ashes of dog's bones. But some, how could something black make your teeth whiter? This place is mad. Lucy glared at him. I don't know why I bothered sorting things out for you. It would have served you right if you'd had to go to school with Peter after all. But this was your bright idea, Joe cried. What did you have to sort out apart from stabbing me? My mother was convinced you were left-handed, Lucy said crossly. She presumed you were holding the net knife in your left hand to gash your right like that. She couldn't see why you'd have trouble writing. It made sense, Joe realised. But you persuaded her. He took a deep breath. Thank you. He did his best to be contrite. It would have been terrible to go through all this for nothing. Lucy thrust her chin out. They set off up the stairs. Suddenly she grinned. You know what else she asked? She wanted to know if you were really so different since the ship. Joe, Joe's eyes widened. What did you say? I said you were a changed person. They both laughed. Not too changed, I hope, came a voice from the landing above them. Joe and Lucy looked at each other. Their laughter died on their lips. I rather liked the old Josiah, Tobias went on. <clears throat> he was lounging in the doorway of his room. What have you done to yourself? he asked Joe, looking at the bandage. I cut myself with the penknife. Joe made himself look Tobias in the face. Oh dear, jeered Lucy's cousin. You have to be so careful with knives. His attention shifted to something or someone across the landing. When a blade goes through flesh, he said, it can do a lot of damage, can't it? Much more than coffee, say, or wax. Joe's heart stopped. Amos must be up here. Some people are just careless once too often, aren't they, Josiah? Tobias spoke deliberately. The threat was plain. Without waiting for Joe's answer, he sauntered off down the stairs. What was all that? Lucy hissed as they climbed the last few stairs to the landing. Are you supposed to be more careful? No. Joe jerked his head towards Amos who was lighting the wall candles. The manservant's face was impassive, but the taper shook slightly as he put the flame next to the wick. Joe moved quietly to stand beside Amos, more conscious than ever that he'd done nothing to defend him. The black man stood completely still. Were you hurt? he asked in a low voice. It was cowardly, he knew, but he didn't want Tobias to overhear him. The wax yesterday and the coffee this afternoon, did they hurt you? Amos didn't look at him. What do you think, Master Josiah? He replied without emotion. Why didn't you tell William then? Why didn't you tell? Why didn't you say Tobias knocked the tray out of your hands? Amos stretched his arm towards the next candle. The taper was steady now. You are Master Tobias's friend, no? He said, without looking round. No, I'm not. I know why you think that, but believe me, I hate him as much as you do. A sound came from Amos that was almost a chuckle. I beg your pardon, but that is not possible. He was silent again. Joe wondered if he was waiting for them to go away. Then Amos said, he is the master. I am the slave. Tobias isn't your master, Lucy corrected him, and you're a servant, not a slave. You should stand up to him. Amos turned. There was a glint of humour in his eyes. Just as you would stand up to your father, refuse to do his bidding, that is not the way of the world, Miss Lucy. We both know it. He blew out the taper 
and stood looking at the flames burning above their heads. Master Tobias is one of you, he went on, just as Mistress Catherine is one of you and your own father and mother and brother, you are all the same. No, we're not, Lucy said hotly. Amos smiled at her, not quite, perhaps, but I must do as each of you bids me. That is my place in the world. He turned to Joe. Of course my skin burns and bleeds like yours does. I feel rage when I am badly treated and frustration. But I have learned to hold my tongue. I can bear more pain, more hatred and anger than you will ever know. A slave who cannot do that cannot survive. There was another silence. It's not like that here, though, is it? Lucy asked in a small voice. Her face was white. The work is easier, Amos answered. There is more food. I am more comfortable and not often afraid. I haven't been whipped since we left Jamaica, so the sores on my back are closing up at last. He gave a wry smile at the children's appalled faces. Your father is a kind master, Miss Lucy, unlike his brother, but he still owns me. I am still his slave. And there is not a day when the servants let me forget that. He lit the taper again and climbed the next flight of stairs to continue lighting the candles further up. Joe and Lucy stood side by side and watched him go. Neither of them spoke. They didn't know what to say. OK, so that's it for chapter 12. I'm sorry about my accent for Amos. I can hear in my mind how it needs to sound. I can't do it. I just can't do it. So, yes, you'll have to forgive me. I'm sorry about that. Um, and in a moment, we'll have the second part of this double bill and we will have chapter 13. But I'm going to log off and log back on to do that. Right. Bye.